Good evening, and welcome to our very last special program about Halley's Comet. What we want to do is to pull together the results of the space probes which went to the comet last March. The comet itself is getting very faint now. It's still in the area of sextants and crater, but it's already out beyond the orbit of Mars, although it's still inside that of Jupiter, but it's fading quickly. But what exactly is a comet? Well, I describe the comet as being the nearest approach to nothing that can still be anything. The only substantial part is the nucleus. And the thinking is that the nucleus, the heart of the comet, is made up chiefly of ices, mainly ordinary water ice mixed up with dust, but with other kinds of ices as well. We have, for example, methane ice, have carbon dioxide ice, and we have ammonia ice. And then in the crust, we have a certain amount of silicate stuff, that's sandy stuff, if you like. And that's the only substantial part of the comet. Outside, we have a mixture of solids and dust and gases, such as um, water vapor, of course, and we have methane, we have carbon dioxide, and we have ammonia, and we have hydrogen cyanide. Now, these are affected by the ultraviolet light from the sun, and that breaks up the atoms, turning into what we call ions, and also gives them an electrical charge. And further out, we have a cloud of these charged particles, making up what's called a plasma, the fourth state of matter, if you like. And the plasma particles move around quickly. And that's where a magnetic field is produced by interaction with the charged particles from what we call the solar wind, which is sent out by the sun continuously in all directions. And that magnetic field produced there can be detected. Well, that was the theory. How could one prove it? The only way was to go there or send space probes to find out. And that's exactly what was done. Ali on first stage ignition and takeoff. Takeoff and... First stage. Europe's first deep space mission, Giotto, was launched from Kourou in French Guyana in July last year. It was planned to fly right through the comet's head at two minutes past midnight on the night of March the 13th, 14th, which it did. It wasn't alone. Japan had two miniature probes, Sakigaki and Suisse, only 70 centimeters high. Russia, another two, the Vegas. Five probes in all, forming the armada that went to meet Halley's Comet during the first two weeks in March. First, Vega 1 on the 6th. Then, Suisse on the 8th. Then, Vega 2 on the 9th. And, Sakigaki on the 11th. And finally, Giotto, on the 13th of March, targeted much closer, at under a 1,000 kilometers from the nucleus. The Giotto flight engineers used the information from the Vega passes to fine-tune their navigation making it possible to fly by the nucleus with remarkable accuracy. They wanted to find out what a comet looked like, what it's made of, what its rotation period is, and how it interacts with the material in the space surrounding it, something you can't find out from Earth. Halley's Comet was chosen because it's unique in being the only large, bright comet which comes back regularly. Also, it's very active. We believe that comets come from a huge cloud at a distance of a light year or so from the sun. If one of these frozen bodies is disturbed for any reason, it falls sunward. If it bypasses a large planet, usually Jupiter, it may be captured and thrown into a short period orbit as Halley's has been. We knew that the only solid part of the comet is the nucleus. As it nears the sun and is warmed, it begins to evaporate. It produces the head or coma and then two types of tails, a plasma or gas tail and a dust tail. The two Japanese probes worked well. Suisse passed the comet on March the 8th at 151,000 kilometers. It was measuring magnetic forces and electrically charged particles in the tail. And with its ultraviolet camera, it found a hydrogen envelope expanding and contracting in a period of 52 hours, confirming the comet's rotation period, or rather that of the nucleus. On March the 6th, Vega 1 made its pass at a mere 9,000 kilometers and sent back these pictures. But it didn't show the nucleus. There was too much dust around it. Then, on March the 9th, came Vega 2 at 8,000 kilometers. Dust destroyed 40% of its solar panels and put some of the instruments out of action. But there were amazing pictures, including this one, which looks as if it shows a double nucleus. Dr. Roel Sagdiev was Vega's chief scientist, and I spoke to him just before the Giotto encounter. Uh, the first impression is that uh, Vega 1 uh, 
and Vega 2 uh, had encountered different comets. The reason uh, why it's so, uh, uh, we have confirmation from different experiments that comet was much more active during uh, the first encounter. It was much more dusty. Did you actually see the nucleus? Uh, I hope so. Uh, we have seen the structure of the region which scales uh, within only a few kilometers and nucleus uh, is uh, certainly there. But probably uh, we have to redefine the, what nucleus really is. It's not, uh, it doesn't look like solid rock. It looks like uh, uh, something of uh, sophisticated, uh, maybe double structure. And uh, the edges of this uh, object are uh, completely made obscure because of probably a lot of dust uh, streams and jets. The favorite theory was that a comet was like a dirty snowball made up of ices together with solid particles. This was put forward by Fred Whipple over 30 years ago. I spoke to him in the afternoon before the encounter and asked him whether he was still confident that he'd be proved right. I certainly am. I think we have a great deal of evidence to, to prove that it is true. Uh, particularly radar uh, observations, radio reflections from the nuclei of four comets showing that there is a discrete body in each one of them. What evidence are you looking for from the office? Well, particularly the, the shape and the surface characteristics of the nucleus, because uh, so far this has been entirely a matter of imagination. Now we will see the real thing. So you're, you're really hoping to see the nucleus tonight? I'm really expecting to see it tonight. Giotto, of course, was scheduled to go right inside the coma, much closer than the other four probes. And all went well with the encounter until two seconds before closest approach, when the picture quality dropped dramatically and finally it was lost altogether. Something was seriously wrong. We lost the spacecraft at 01 hours, 10 minutes and 58 seconds. That is precisely two seconds before closest approach. All experiments worked beautifully until then, and since two seconds before closest approach, corresponding to about 150 kilometers, we lost data. The um, orbit um, directorate people are now trying to get back the spacecraft signal. When I left them just two minutes ago, they were hoping to get lock again on the signal every minute. BSN receivers are locking back up. They're coming back up. And in Paris, two months later, the first results of the Giotto mission were announced here at the headquarters of the European Space Agency. How badly had that temporary loss of signal affected the project? And what was Giotto's state of health now? We entered the comet and we flew up to a point about two seconds before closest approach when we got hit by a relatively large particle and that disturbed the spacecraft to, a, to an extent where the signal level became fluctuating wildly at the ground stations. That was because the spacecraft was wobbling uh, dramatically. That was recovered after about 30 minutes when the nutation dampers damped out the oscillation on the spacecraft. And then uh, we completed the mission and subsequently made an assessment of what kind of damage we'd suffered. And we found that uh, we had had se severe damage to the thermal subsystem, especially in the shield area. Uh, much of it had been uh, taken away, we feel. The star mapper was inoperative. The data handling subsystem had been corrupted, especially some of the software in the memories. And one of the transmitters, in fact, had failed during the encounter and the onboard redundancy had uh, switched over to the, uh, to the standby transmitter. Of course, the danger of dust was very much in our minds. The principal scientific investigator here was Professor Tony MacDonald of Kent University. But Tony, the dust shield did turn out to be effective. It did indeed. It protected the spacecraft and the scientific instruments right the way through to encounter. And, of course, it was acting as a scientific detector until that time, and we recorded 12,000 impacts on the way to encounter. You can show us that on a computer, can't you? Yes, indeed. Now, this computer isn't a simulation so much as a... Uh, one controlled by the actual event record right the way through encounter in the last minute. We see particles then hitting the centre part of the motor cover, but indeed also hitting this sensor around that two square metres in area. And then, almost at the last moment, there was an impact from a slightly larger particle, just enough to throw the spacecraft out of alignment. 
Yes, that particle was perhaps about 40 milligrams in weight, indeed, and about the size of a grain of rice. And that impact did indeed throw it off by perhaps one degree, and we lost radio contact for a while. Isn't it amazing how a small particle like that can do so much damage? Absolutely. Now, this grain of rice, of course, has the energy of a shotgun blast at that speed. Was any part of the spacecraft torn away by dust? We have to consider that very seriously, because, in fact, the whole axis of the spacecraft is different now. The mass distribution has changed. We might have lost a bit of the motor cover, perhaps, or indeed, perhaps one of the supporting struts. Where did the dust come from? Is it purely from the cometary nucleus? Well, we had operated the instrument for 150 hours before approaching Halley, and we saw no particles at all. So certainly it all comes from Halley, and we have been able to trace these back to the nucleus. On the whole, did you have more or less trouble from the dust than you expected? Well, we had no trouble. Uh, the instrument was detecting what we intended to, indeed, and we got great data. What about the amount of dust? The dust was concentrated in the larger masses. That was a surprise. We found there were more big particles than expected. Well, certainly, without this very effective dust shield, Giotto would have failed. Tony, congratulations to you and all your team. Thank you. At Paris, I talked to Dr. Horst Ovart Keller, who was head of the Halley Multicolor Camera Team. Now, that camera sent back remarkable color pictures, but the colors were, in fact, false, and Dr. Keller explained why he used them. Uh, those colors are also false colors, and uh, they also describe only the brightness variation across the nucleus and just enhance the features to uh, make them more easy visible. And this is, in fact, uh, one of the first images where we saw the first hints of uh, the cometary nucleus taken a half an hour before encounters. You can see a dark point. This is where you have a, st a strong concentration of uh, contrast change. This is the next one indeed, and this is taken from a distance of uh, 25,000 kilometers, and you can see the si silhouette of uh, the cometary nucleus, the unilluminated uh, part, as a silhouette against the scattered light produced by the dust in the background of the nucleus. Uh, you can also see clearly jets uh, going in various directions, and we believe at this stage that uh, even though it uh, may look different, that all the jets uh, come from the sunlit hemisphere of uh, the nucleus. And here we have yet another picture, again, fascinating. Where exactly is the nucleus in this one? Uh, the nucleus is on the right-hand side, the unilluminated part again, and uh, you can see the strong jets emanating on the left-hand side, and the uh, illuminated part of the uh, nucleus is somewhere, ends somewhere where the jets begin. It is at this stage not clear how uh, broad how wide the nucleus is. This is an image taken from a distance of less than 5,000 kilometers. The image frame size is about 8 kilometers, and you can see scalloped uh, features, circular features, uh, l looking almost like craters and uh, hills and uh, lower parts. And uh, the resolution there is about 100 meter per picture element. And this one was even closer in. That is correct. Uh, it's taken uh, from a distance of 2,000 kilometers. Now the frame size is 3.7 kilometers. And uh, it's concentrating on the north and on the upper tip of the, uh, the cometary nucleus. And you can see jets emanating uh, out of places which look almost like nozzles. I think you must be very pleased with the results of your camera. I think we are, and I should mention at this point, we are a very large team, and we work very hard, and every, everybody is very pleased, and we were surprised how well the data came out. Giotto was designed to study the solar wind plasma and its interaction with the cometary plasma, starting a long way out at 5 million kilometers and coming into the contact surface at 5,000 kilometers from the nucleus, the contact surface being the region where the purely cometary plasma meets the mixture of cometary and solar wind plasma. Alan Johnstone of the Mallard Space Science Laboratory was in charge of a plasma experiment. Alan, what were the main results? Well, we were very lucky because we were able to observe the way the comet interacted with the solar wind from one side of the comet right through to the other side. And we only lost about 30 seconds of data in the middle. Now, in the picture which we see here, this only covers the last two and a half million kilometers on either side of the comet. But even so, the comet itself, the visible part of the comet that we see, only occupies a very tiny part of the middle of this, as you can now see in the picture. Now, the reason for that is that the neutral particles, when they come off the nucleus, travel a long way out before they become electrically charged. And it's not until they're electrically charged that they affect the solar wind. Now, as they become electrically charged, they're accelerated by the solar wind, and they become detectable in our instruments. 
Now, the energy that's provided to them and their momentum has to come from the solar wind. And in doing so, that slows down the solar wind. Now, the closer you get to the comet, the more ions are produced and the more the solar wind is slowed down. Now, in this diagram which you see here, in the bottom panel, we can see the solar wind ions, a broad green stripe which gets lower as we get closer to the comet. Along the bottom, we've got time or distance, if you like, and the vertical scale is the energy or the speed. And so as the speed drops towards the middle, that's because of the loading of the cometary wind ions. In the upper panel, you can see the cometary ions themselves, and they are accelerated up to energies of about 30 kilovolts. Now, we can see a bow shock in here. We've marked the position with the two lines, but it doesn't have a big effect on the solar wind, although the structure of it, when we look at it in detail, is very complicated. Inside the bow shock, on either side, we see accelerated cometary ions. At the point of closest approach, we saw something even more dramatic. There, we didn't expect to see anything in our detectors because they were looking in the wrong direction to detect those ions. But in actual fact, we saw very high fluxes, which we believe were caused by the impact of dust particles on the spacecraft. So certainly you learned a great deal from it. Alan, thank you very much indeed. indeed. And now for some comet chemistry. The idea was that inside the comet, there were what we call parent or mother molecules, as the ices, and there were some solids, and also tarry substances, such as hydrocarbons. They emerged from the comet, when heated by the sun, and they're broken down and recombine with others. They can also receive a positive charge when they're broken up or ionized by the ultraviolet radiation from the sun. These mother molecules then recombine with other gases and elements in the dust, forming substances such as oh, carbon monoxide and cyanogen, which also can be ionized. In charge of measuring these ionized masses and determining the chemical composition of the comet was Dr. Hans Balziger. And I asked him what his experiments had shown him about the makeup of the comet. We, we have certainly learned that the comet is basically made out of water ice or water snow. That's the main constituent. Then we see some interesting other constituents like uh, carbon, uh, CO, CO2, things we, which we more uh, have expected quite a bit. Obviously the carbon is very important. What's its main significance? The basic fact that, that there is so much of carbon uh, probably tells us that we have very primitive material. Uh, uh, well, material is a lot of carbon, and that is really similar to carbonaceous chondrites, material like that, and it tells us it's from very early in the solar system. What about the organic content? The organic content, that's hard to say at the moment. The, uh, they they uh, discompose when they come off the comet, when they are out and get ionized. They are no more uh, the full molecules, but only part of them, and we, we need some more time to work together with all the other mass spectrometers uh, in order to put the puzzle together again and, and hope that we can then uh, conclude on the composition of mother molecules. A comet is believed to be a very old, a relic from the formation of the solar system. We know that there's a great deal of hydrogen there, together with helium, but there are different kinds of hydrogen. An analysis of the various different kinds, or isotopes, may help us to understand a great deal more about the origin of the solar system. Now, this hasn't yet been done, but Dr. Balzigar has been carrying out this analysis, and he realizes the significance of it. That's right. That will be very important, but also very difficult. So at the moment, I wouldn't bet on, uh, on it that we can make it. But if we are, for instance, able to measure the, the ratio between the heavy uh, uh, water and the normal water, and get the deuterium to hydrogen ratio like that, that would be cosmologically very important. The same would be true for uh, oxygen uh, isotopes. Comets are associated with particles of all kinds. Some are more energetic than others. The principal scientific investigator of the energetic particle experiment is Professor Susan mckenna Lawler of St. Patrick's College, Maynooth. Susan, what were the main results? There are three main points, Patrick, that I would like to draw your attention to. If we have a look at the plot of the energetic particles that we uh, recorded in the cometary environment, for example, let us take telescope three there, running along the bottom of the chart. There are counts of cometary particles against time, March 12 to March 15, so this is a complete encounter. The very first time that we uh, got a real particle signature from Halley's Comet was when Giotto was still at 7.5 million kilometers out from the nucleus. That was still on March the 12th. 
Now, these are particles which have received energies from the solar wind. They're what are called pickup ions. And if we assume that those ions are of the water species, and after all, water is the most predominant species at Halley's Comet, then we would expect that they should pick up energies of about 70 keV. What we're seeing there are very much higher energies than that, in fact, hundreds of keV. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what is the process which is going on in addition to the pickup process from the solar wind? which is giving us that result. Then as we come closer in to uh, Comet Encounter, we got a most dramatic burst of particles. We don't really know quite what that is at the moment. It could be due to dust impact on the sensors, or it might be uh, due to ultraviolet photons hitting the sensors, but on the other hand, it may well be cometry. The Vega experimenters saw something rather similar. So this is a very challenging question. Is this of cometry origin? This is something we want to look at very carefully. And then as we flew out on the other side, we found that the cometary signatures that we were getting were very different on the outbound pass from those that we saw on the inbound pass. So again, another scientific question, why should it be that the particle signatures outbound are different from those inbound? Well, certainly there's a lot to be learned yet, but many congratulations, Susan, to you and all your team upon a really flawless experiment. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Giotto's project scientist was Rudiger Reinhardt. In Paris, I asked him to summarize the main results and what have we really learned about the comet's nucleus. The nucleus is not a sphere as we had assumed before the encounter. It is rather elongated. Uh, you can describe it as a peanut or a potato. It uh, is 15 kilometers in one axis. In the other axis, at least seven kilometers, probably larger. It is difficult to uh, know exactly how large it is because the sunward side is obscured from view by dust particles. It appears that there is a waste in the middle of the nucleus. Uh, this is probably an artifact, although we can't really be sure, uh, which is due to a dust jet, uh, dust particles emanating from the nucleus at about that region, giving the appearance of a waste. We find uh, crater-like uh, surface features. I'm using the word crater here just uh, because it's such a nice graphical word. What we see is a circular feature or several circular features of uh, 1 to 1.5 kilometers in diameter. The surface is uh, probably quite rough with hills and valleys. It has an albedo of only 2%, which makes it one of the darkest objects in the solar system. Uh, we believe that the nucleus is covered with a dust crust. Uh, we don't know how deep the dust crust is, depending on the material and how it is layered. It could be at least a centimeter, but it could also be several meters in thickness. The comet is sending out an amazing amount of water. The comet nucleus is mostly made out of water ice. In fact, 80% of it is water ice. And the amount of water that is uh, sent out by Halley's Comet at the time when we uh, crossed the coma was about 16 tons per second. And to put this in perspective, this amount corresponds to water from 50,000 garden hoses at full power. Were you surprised at this amount? No, in fact, we expected 80% of water. Were there any other surprises? Uh, there were also major surprises in the areas of dust composition and uh, dust flux measurements, the dust size spectrum turned out to be a surprise. In the area of uh, gas and uh, iron composition measurements, uh, we were surprisingly uh, close to the observations with our expectations. And also in the area of plasma physics, uh, um, uh, we were actually quite close with our predictions. Uh, this in self, itself, that we were so close, can also be considered as a surprise. There were plenty of surprises. What about predictions? Sir Fred Hoyle had made some. As regards the predictions, we made three, and two, I think I can say, uh, fairly certainly were correct, and the other one is doubtful. Uh, the, the two that were correct was, firstly, we said the surface would be very dark, and very dark it is. Uh, there are many ways in which one can get a dark surface, some very fairly simple, some rather subtle, and it remains to be seen which is the right answer here. The second prediction that was correct is that we said the solid material that comes out, the solid particles that come out, would be hollow, they would have a si certain size, and that they would be organic, and all these were true. 
And finally, if I come to the, uh, the place where we may be wrong, we thought the comet might be multiple, as the first R Russian Vega observation seemed to suggest was true, and, but which people don't think is, is true now. But since our multiplicity was a, a jum jumble of rather closely spaced, placed objects, um, I think it's perhaps a little uncertain, but, but probably we were wrong in that one. Well, one man who did make a prediction that a comet would be a dirty snowball was, of course, Fred Whipple. He also invented that magnificently successful dust shield, I may say, and he'd been associated with cometary research now for many years. And it's a great honor to have him with us now. Fred, what do you think of Giotto's results, and how far does it go to confirming your ideas? Well, I think it verifies them completely and gloriously myself. I'm delighted with the results, and uh, particularly the, the dirty snowball was a little dirtier than we expected. But that was not really a surprise. And uh, I think that the uh, irregular shape, we don't know exactly what it was, but it was, a, it was not at all a perfect sphere the way uh, planets and satellites are. Uh, I think that means that it was a very badly battered body long ago in its youth, which was about uh, 4,000 million years ago in the outer portions of the solar system when it was young. I think it had some very bad times. Uh, then. Well, certainly you've been right. Was there anything there that really surprised you? Well, uh, I, I, not completely surprising. No, I, th I don't think I was, uh, I was shocked by any of the results. I think that the, the surprise is that the engineers did such a beautiful job and that they received, made so many results. I think that was the most surprising part, is a highly successful, uh, high success of so many experiments on this uh, adventure. And what next in cometary research? Well, the next thing we need, of course, is what we call the rendezvous mission, in which you go by the comet, stay with it for months or years, and see exactly what happens and study the nucleus. And then, of course, as soon as we can, we need to bring samples back. Because if we can bring samples back and study them in the, with all the sophistication of the of our laboratories. Then we can tell exactly when comets were made, where they were made, and their relation to life on Earth. Well, certainly we know a great deal more about comets now than we did uh, a few weeks ago, and congratulations upon all your work over the years. It's been a great honor to have you with us. Thank you. So now we are really saying goodbye to Halley's Comet. It's on its way back to the far reaches of the solar system. It won't return until the year 2061. But we may not have said goodbye to Giotto, because we know Giotto has survived its passage through Halley's Comet. It is still under control. It's now on its way back to the Earth. It will get back to the neighborhood of the Earth in July 1990. And then, if all goes well, it will be sent on to another periodical comet in July 1992. That does require extra funding from the European Space Organization. We hope that will be forthcoming, because Giotto still has work to do. And in any case, there's no doubt whatever that the combination of Giotto and Halley's Comet has led to one of the major triumphs of the space age. Good night. <laughs>